We're excited today to have um, Dr. Jan Boone Heinenen, who is an associate professor of epidemiology at Oregon Health and Science University um, within the OHSU Portland State University um, School of Public Health, which is a really interesting kind of combined enterprise for the Oregon Public University system. Her research interests focus on early life, behavioral and environmental factors, influence on cardiometabolic health, and related disparities throughout the full life course. Uh, she completed her PhD in nutrition epidemiology and an interdisciplinary obesity training postdoc fellowship at the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill. And at OHSU, she works with interdisciplinary teams to conduct NIH funded women's and children's health research in electronic medical record derived cohorts and other li large study populations. So we have a lot of points of interest for IHPS around the um, what some of us call the commercial determinants of health or the dietary determinants of health that are often influenced by industry and difficult to influence through policy, as well as um, an interest in children and young people all the way through the life to older people. So I'm looking forward to this talk. Thank you and good morning. I'm really excited to be here to uh, share my research and hopefully spur some ideas for collaboration. Um, the kind of overarching theme to my research is prevention of cardiometabolic disease um, by integrating biological processes, behavioral processes, um, as well as social and environmental um, drivers of health. So the key um, kind of biological process that we'll focus on today is um, developmental origins of disease um, or fetal programming. By now, this concept is, is pretty well known, um, but I will kind of walk you through this, um, this framework um, to kind of define my terms, and it also provides a structure um, for my talk. Um, so, so shown here, um, this is we're showing maternal obesity as a as a prenatal um, exposure or factor, but this applies to many other prenatal um, conditions. Um, and the idea here is that um, prenatal exposures can influence the physiological development of the fetus. Um, in a way that alters um, their susceptibility to obesity and related disease throughout their life course. Okay, so these physiological changes are indicated in your work um, by this red star. Um, so with this process, we are concerned not only for the, um, the health of this offspring, this generation, um, but as they grow up and become parents of their own, um, we're concerned about this, um, the propagation um, of this process um, to, to the next generation. Um, so, you know, I think it's it's well accepted um, that it's important to interrupt this cycle. Um, what's really quite unknown is is how how to achieve that. So the bulk of the uh, evidence um, in this area um, relate um, first to associations. Um, so we have a enormous body of literature showing associations between um, a wide variety of prenatal exposures and a wide variety of um, outcomes. Um, we're learning more about the biologic mechanisms that give rise to those associations, but still we're left with um, not a lot of um, guidance um, for actionable strategies um, to take. So in this talk, I will talk about uh, my research that centers on um, kind of three um, intervention points. Um, maternal health, including preconception and pregnancy health, um, early childhood, uh, as well as adolescence. Okay, so um, ultimately, um, I'm striving to build upon those first two points, the associations and mechanisms. Um, third, um, to provide evidence that um, informs clinical guidelines that are appropriate for um, pregnant people with larger bodies um, or from historically oppressed groups. And also to provide evidence 
uh, for policies and guidelines that recognize um, vulnerabilities that originate in the, pre the perinatal period. Okay, so we'll start with pregnancy health. Um, this is really the focus of um, prevention efforts um, for this intergenerational cycle. Um, first, um, related to preconception weight loss, nutrition, um, and second, um, he healthy gestational weight gain and nutrition during pregnancy. And I'll talk about both of these um, pieces. Okay, so we'll start with preconception, uh, specifically preconception weight loss. Um, so preconception weight loss is um, it recommended um, for people um, with obesity. Um, there's been interventions um, tested and developed to achieve it. Um, what I have been very interested in is um, the unintended, potential unintended consequences of these recommendations. There's actually very little evidence um, for the risks and benefits um, for preconception weight loss um, on uh, maternal and child outcomes. Um, you know, to begin with, um, the idea of starting pregnancy potentially in negative energy balance. Um, what does that mean um, for appetite regulation um, during pregnancy? Um, given what we know about weight cycling um, in the general population, what would it mean if pregnancy was a period of weight regain? Um, and then kind of overlaid with the motivational and social changes that occur during pregnancy, this could become a very complicated um, process and issue. So, I tested um, the, this um, sort of concern and um, hypothesis um, with a retrospective pregnancy cohort. Um, this was using um, electronic medical record data from Kaiser Permanente Northwest region. Um, I was really fortunate to have um, co collaborators at Kaiser, um, Steve Fortman um, and Kim, Kim Veska. This was part of a Birch K-12 um, award. Uh, we examined um, over, over 14,000 women, um, really focused on live births. Um, we extracted information going back two years prior to pregnancy, um, as well as two years um, after pregnancy, both for the mother um, and for the child. Okay, and I'll show you uh, some findings. Um, so, Given the large volume of data, um, especially weight data from the EMR, um, we used this um, initial approach to examine um, preconception weight loss trajectories. These are uh, latent trajectory groups. Um, essentially, um, this approach identifies uh, latent groups of women um, that have similar intercepts or um, um, starting values um, for this is for BMI, um, as well as similar slopes or changes over time. Okay, so on the y axis here we have BMI, um, and this is quarter relative to pregnancy. So we're going back two years prior to pregnancy all the way up to pregnancy. Um, these were growth mixture models, um, and we identified three or four classes. Um, so the simplest one here is class one. Um, this is a lower BMI group that was um, fairly weight stable over time. Um, class two was a high BMI group, um, also weight stable prior to pregnancy. These were the two classes that were of most interest. Okay, so these were in the kind of the mid range um, of the of the range of BMIs. Um, this is the all above thirty on average. Um, but what we're seeing here is the class three was um, losing weight and um, class four was gaining weight. Okay, so this was um, aligns with um, our sort of concerns about weight, weight loss prior to pregnancy. Uh, we examined associations um, between uh, the membership in these classes and adherence to gestational weight gain. Um, we compared to this uh, lower BMI weight stable group, um, and here in the left column, this is gaining uh, less than recommended um, by the IOM um, named at the time, um, and or greater than recommended. 
and I'll focus here on these class three and four. Uh, so class three had uh, just barely slightly lower odds of gaining less than recommended um, and higher odds of gaining more than recommended compared to that low BMI weight stable group. And that's that aligns with um, our hypothesis. Um, class four was um, high, higher odds of gaining both less than and more than recommended. Okay, so this is just the beginning um, of a story. Um, so it was the starting point. So the implications of this um, is, you know, first, perhaps we should be concerned about unintended consequences of preconception weight loss. Um, it suggests that um, those who do lose weight prior to pregnancy might require long-term support throughout pregnancy. Um, and it raises uh, scientific questions about the impact of, of weight loss um, on energy regulation during pregnancy. So I shared these findings at a research seminar at Center for Health Research at Kaiser Northwest. Uh, and it turns out that the findings aligned with um, preliminary findings from a preconception weight loss intervention. Um, this was Aaron LeBlanc and Kim Vesco. Um, and we all became very excited and um, recognizes, recognized that we needed a larger study. Um, grant writing ensued, um, and we were able to get this um, funded by NICHD. Um, so this is now a multi-site um, Kaiser study, um, four sites, Northwest, Hawaii, Southern California, and Georgia. Um, we're examining a wider range of um, sort of BMI groups as well as outcomes. Um, so we're examining maternal preconception weight change on um, gestational weight gain, postpartum weight retention, pregnancy and birth outcomes, and child growth. Um, and we're really uh, we're really excited. Um, I get, we're a little past launch of the study. We just started uh, year two. Um, we've defined and assembled the cohort. Um, anyone who has worked with EMR data knows that that is not a small feat. Um, <laughs> we're working on work linking birth records, defining and creating the study variables, and we're really excited to move forward with the the outcomes analysis. Okay. So, uh, so now we're in sort of part B of that first section. Um, so now we're, we're moving forward um, to pregnancy um, and interested in gestational weight gain. Um, and specifically, um, what is the optimal amount and timing of gestational weight gain? Um, we're particularly interested in people with class two or class three obesity. There's very little evidence um, for um, gestational weight gain in these groups. Um, the recommendations um, group all obesity BMI over 30 together. Um, and um, I'll show you some, there, there's evidence um, in the broader literature that that's not appropriate. Um, and I'll show some evidence that we found from our study. Okay, and here um, we're particularly interested here in child outcomes. Okay, so um, the study that I'll show you, you know, addresses the, the uh, knowledge gaps um, for obesity subclasses, um, as well as um, knowledge gaps really um, within um, sort of socially vulnerable subgroups. Okay, um, so I'm, I'm starting an, another. Um, <laughs> research story here. Um, the kind of foundation um, for this work um, started with um, ADVANCE, um, which was a site um, with a PCORNET um, study. This is a multi-site um, uh, study that um, combined data from um, multiple health networks, so things like Kaiser's um, and group health. Um, this was a really unique and exciting project to work on because ADVANCE um, includes data from community health centers. So they serve um, safety net patients. Um, it includes the uninsured, underinsured, undocumented immigrants, and other vulnerable populations. So it was really um, great to be able to contribute um, to PCORNET in that way. Um, so I was the uh, the obesity cohort lead um, for advance and was um, able to 
sort of mold um, mold our obesity cohort um, into the sort of perinatal direction. Um, so we um, identified and characterized um, an early life cohort. Um, this was over 200,000 um, low income infants and children. Uh, we developed methods um, for data cleaning um, of the, the child weights. Um, we used a sort of longitudinal within child method. So it was a particular weight um, implausible based on that, the other weights um, for that child, as opposed to using kind of po population level cut points. Um, and we um, we're also a part of a, one of the demonstration projects um, that focused on antibiotic use. Um, but pertinent here is that we were one of three sites that um, linked parents and children. Um, and so we have linked um, parent-child data, which really set us up for this next phase. And I'm happy to answer any questions about any of those studies. Um, okay. So that um, launched um, this PROMISE study. This is um, preventing obesity through healthy maternal gestational weight gain in the safety net. Um, what we're doing is um, within the advanced cohort, um, determining overall and trimester specific gestational weight gain associated with the lowest risk of uh, adverse birth and longer term outcomes in children. Um, we're really we're examining across the BMI spectrum. We're very interested in um, the, those higher BMI categories. So this is a um, ex really exciting study team. Um, we have um, the epidemiologists are the School of Public Health, um, including graduate students. Um, are, I'm working with the, uh, the biostats team in family medicine, in the school of medicine. Um, OCHIN is the sort of manage, manages the, um, the data, um, and they're really expert, um, in this, um, this, uh, analysis of, of the data, um, and working with, um, collaborators with, uh, at Kaiser Permanente Northwest. Okay. So uh, we have done a lot of work identifying, characterizing the cohort, um, and as, as well as using different approaches for measuring um, and characterizing gestational weight gain. Um, so I'll just show you one example, which I think is really um, illustrative of the complexities that we're dealing with, um, and it has implications for, um, for policy and recommendations. Um, so shown here, um, this is again using a sort of a late latent group um, trajectory approach. Um, here we, we examine just um, first observed pregnancy during the study period, um, applied um, pretty stringent um, weight availability um, criteria. Um, this was using PROCTRAG, um, which is a slightly different method. Okay, so um, I'm show here, um, this is for obesity class one, and we're seeing four groups um, in orange here. This indicates the, uh, the range for the recommended uh, weight gain um, for um, BMI over 30. Okay, so you can see that we're, there's one class that is meeting those, um, those guidelines. Um, we're seeing weight loss um, in several groups, and we're seeing a range of um, sort of rate and overall um, weight gain. Okay, and so this is um, showing a little bit smaller um, for all um, three obesity classes, class one, class two in the middle, class three on the right. Um, and essentially what we're seeing is we're seeing um, similar patterns across um, classes, um, but more extreme weight loss um, with higher BMI levels. And in class three, we actually um, found um, a, an additional fifth class um, showing pretty extreme um, weight gain that was never, or excuse me, weight loss that was never regained. Okay, so... There's a lot to look at here, so I'll highlight just a few key findings. Um, so over half of patients 
um, were classified in trajectory groups with first trimester weight loss. Um, the guidelines do not address weight loss during pregnancy at all. Um, only trajectories that ended, um, or the, excuse me, the only trajectories that ended within the recommendations began with weight loss. Um, and weight loss is more extreme for women with class three obesity. Okay, but so um, in terms of implications, um, the IOM guidelines um, for BMI over 30 may not be appropriate for women um, over with BMIs over 35. Um, and really importantly, the risks and benefits of early pregnancy weight loss should be evaluated um, and incorporated into the um, clinical guidelines. Okay, so this is, um, you know, just sort of one of the first steps that we've taken, um, focusing on our exposure of interest, um, gestational weight gain. Um, it, we have, we are very close <laughs> to um, completing our analyses um, of child outcomes. So obviously the next step in understanding um, these risks and benefits are to examine um, associations with outcomes. So we um, look forward to reporting those um, this next year. Okay. So I just talked about pregnancy health, preconception, and pregnancy. Now we're shifting, we're shifting to the children now. Okay, so we're in this sort of section two to three. Um, and thinking about, okay, so what based on what we know about developmental origins of disease and fetal programming, kind of what, what can Um, it's, it's fine. <laughs> uh, as early as birth, um, babies um, can be born with more adipose tissue. Um, they can be born with insulin resistance. Um, there can, throughout um, the life course, um, we see ch changes in all body systems. So changes in the brain, um, the impact appetite regulation. Um, changes in skeletal muscle that can impact glucose regulation, liver, um, which can impact lipid metabolism. Okay. Um, and all of these, all of these components um, raise risk for cardiometabolic disease. Okay, so I'm gonna focus now on those these changes to the brain. Um, and specifically related to appetite regulation. So um, in animal models, um, there is very robust evidence of these neuronal changes that do impact um, appetite control um, and the uh, obesity that's developed um, later in life is driven by hyperphagia or overeating um, in the animals. Um, there's much less evidence for humans. Most of it's based on kind of parent questionnaires to understand the eating behaviors of the kids. Okay, so um, I connected with collaborators at um, the University of Michigan. They have this really incredible um, ABC cohort. It's appetite, behavior, and cortisol. Um, these were toddlers and preschoolers who were uh, recruited from Head Start programs. So these were um, low from lower income families. Um, and they collected, as you can imagine, a very wide range of data, um, including this um, eating in the absence of hunger protocol. Um, so this is um, the gold standard measure or considered the gold standard measure of eating disinhibition. Um, and what this does is essentially you bring, you bring the kids in and you feed them. <laughs> you feed them a preload pre meal until they're full. And then they're moved to a different location where they have um, a variety of sweet and salty snacks and there's toys. 
And essentially you leave them there for 10 minutes, observe, and then determine how much of the snacks they ate and which kind. Okay, so this is the, how much are they consuming after they were already full? So that's, um, that's what's shown here. Um, this is uh, calories consumed um, in the absence of hunger, this, in ca this case for sweet foods. Um, I'm showing this just for girls here. Um, and we're um, plotted this as a function of um, birth weight Z-score. Okay, and this curve here, if, if anyone's examined, uh, seen um, the evidence related to birth weight and various birth outcome or um, chronic disease outcomes, um, this looks very similar to that curve. It's U-shaped, so we're seeing essentially um, less eating dis disinhibition, poor appetite control in girls who were born on the lower end and the higher end. Okay, and again, this mirrors what we see for disease outcomes. Um, importantly, um, this pattern was not observed in boys. And this will be, this is a common theme that we have seen. I've seen it in um, multiple study populations, different types of research questions. Um, very interesting that it tends to be shown in girls and not in boys. Okay, so what, why does this matter? Um, so, you know, first and for, foremost, it indicates that we have such groups of children. Um, in this case, it's defined or, you know, identified by prenatal um, factors um, who have difficulty regulating their intake. Um, and it suggests that poor appetite regulation might be an important mechanism um, underlying prenatally induced predisposition dispositions to disease. Um, and again, the sex differences um, as well. Most exciting and interesting um, to me is the implications for the food environment. So much of my early work focused on built environment, neighborhood environment, um, and I kind of always intended just kind of loop back to it. But if we think about a um, oh, generation of children um, who have difficulty regulating their intake in our current, current food environment that we find ourselves in, um, this is quite troubling, um, that they may be hyper-responsive um, to the sort of toxic conditions um, that they're growing up in related to marketing, food marketing, um, pricing, other manipulations. Um, this tends to be extremely depressing um, for people to think about, um, including myself. Um, and so this last point um, just kind of reframes this as a positive. You know, if they're hyper responsive to these conditions, maybe that will occur on the positive side as well. Maybe small changes in the environment could, could induce larger changes in, um, in behavior and outcomes. Okay, so um, I'm really interested in moving this work forward, um, understanding how we can disrupt um, the programming of early childhood eating behavior. Uh, and uh, with that goal, um, I connected with um, Dr. Betty Azumi, um, who is a expert in community nutrition and community-based participatory research. Um, and we, we um, sought to do um, was to adapt this eating in the absence of hunger protocol for a community setting. Um, and so we um, conducted this pilot study um, to adapt the protocol, um, develop a survey um, for the mothers and also in, integrate the, the community um, throughout the process. Um, so shown here, we have community data collectors and advisors, um, and this is the preload meal um, that was uh, from a local vendor recommended by the community um, advisors. Okay, this is a picture of the setup. Um, you know, we this was a pilot study, so we just um, uh, included 16 um, other child pairs. Um, the average intakes were um, total of 63 cal calories, 
Um, they ate more sweet foods than salty foods. Um, but there was also a huge range from eating no snacks um, to a, a really large number of snacks. Okay, so we're looking um, forward to um, sort of building on this work um, with uh, uh, and more um, R21 or R01 grants um, to understand these processes. Okay. So, um, so this brings us to our third section. So thinking about and how can we overcome these program susceptibilities? Um, here I'm gonna focus on, I just focused on the brain um, and now I'm focusing on skeletal muscle. I also have an ongoing interest in physical activity and exercise. Um, we, under, we, you know, it's, it's um, broadly known that exercise um, improves glucose regulation, you know, independent from um, BMI or um, body composition. Um, so given the uh, influence or the changes that occur um, from pre based on prenatal factors to skeletal muscle and the impact on glucose regulation, um, wanted to investigate perhaps if physical activity could help kind of mitigate or attenuate those, those associations. Okay, so the, another way to think about this is um, it's sort of a prenatal postnatal interaction. Okay, so this was just this is an initial um, cross-sectional study um, using NHANES data, um, and I'll, I'm showing it here um, mainly because it's it's very nice to illustrate the concepts um, that I'm I'm trying to convey. Um, so this is again for boy for girls only. Um, these are adolescents. Um, this is predicted BMI Z score um, on the y-axis. Um, and phys physical activity um, in met hours per week um, on the x-axis. This is kind of a measure of overall volume of physical activity. And we're showing this for um, three birth weight categories. So high birth weight is in red, uh, low birth weight in blue, black, and then <laughs> normal birth weight in black. Um, so the most obvious um, sort of Finding here is this, um, this gap. Um, so we're seeing higher BMI in adolescents um, and girls who were born with higher birth weight. Okay, so um, the most sort of pertinent um, aspect is the narrowing of this difference with higher levels of physical activity. So we're seeing weaker associations between birth weight and BMI among those with higher physical activity levels. And so this is getting at that mitigation idea. Okay, and then a more nuanced um, point um, that can be gleaned um, from this graph um, is more of a sort of a heterogeneous response. And so, you know, in this red uh, high birth weight group, we're seeing kind of a very intuitive um, you know, lower BMI with higher levels of physical activity, but these lines are pretty flat, which is um, not unusual for epi studies and physical activity for a wide variety of reasons. Um, but for these other birth weight groups, these are pretty flat. So it's su su suggesting heterogeneous um, associations with um, risk factors like physical activity that we study all the time. Um, and maybe, you know, but without recognizing potential um, sort of differential responses to those risk factors. Can you define the horizontal axis mm -hmm. of met hours per week? Yeah, so uh, this is a moderate to vigorous physical activity. Um, so each type of physical activity, so, you know, walking at a certain rate or running or playing soccer is attached to a certain um, uh, level of the uh, number of metabolic equivalents. And so that's sort of the sort of the intensity of the exercise. Um, and then, you know, you sort of um, include the frequency and duration of, of each type of activity, and you get this kind of total, total volume 
Okay. Office so these aren't literally hours per week. Right. right. I didn't think they were. I just wanted to make sure I understood what I was looking at. Yeah. Thank you. Got it. Okay. Um, so we uh, we we conducted a longitudinal analysis in a different study population using a uh, different outcome um, CVD risk score um, and found sort of these similar um, similar heterogeneous results um, according to birth weight. Okay, so this is the last um, set of results that I'll show. Um, this is using uh, data from the National Longitudinal Study of Adolescent to Adult Health. Um, it's a school-based study um, that follows adolescents um, into adulthood. Um, at the time of this study, there were four waves um, of data available. I believe there's a fifth now. Um, and the question here is, um, so we have a wealth of uh, evidence um, showing associations between birth weight and diabetes and pre-diabetes. Um, so the question here, here is, are there, are there different multiple mechanisms that explain those associations? Um, and so typically what we think about is, you know, that this is occurring through BMI. You know, so if you're higher, um, you know, born with a higher birth weight, um, you may have higher BMI in adolescence. So this is BMI at baseline. Um, this is during adolescence. Um, and you may gain weight more quickly um, as you age. Um, so this is the BMI slope. So this is sort of the, uh, the rate um, of uh, BMI increase into adulthood. Okay, and both of those would increase risk of prediabetes and diabetes. So this is kind of what we normally think about, um, but based on what we understand from about me the mechanisms of programming is that there are other pathways. So specifically related to diabetes, changes in the pancreas. Um, the pancreas, of course, is um, responsible for producing insulin, um, which is needed to regulate glucose. Okay, so if we have deficiencies in the pancreas, um, we could that um, occur um, due to conditions that are correlated with birth weight, right? There may be this other pathway to diabetes that does not depend on BMI and obesity. Okay. Um, so, we use this at health data um, to um, test this um, hypothesis. Um, this is using structural equation modeling, which essentially um, estimates each of these pathways um, simultaneously. And um, this is what we found. Okay, so um, I, this is a, the birth weight was modeled as a quadratic term. So again, that sort of U-shaped um, um, pattern, um, but it was kind of monotonic. So um, I just showed the directions here uh, to make it a little bit simpler to look at. Um, so essentially higher birth weight was related to higher BMI in adolescence, faster BMI gains into adulthood. Um, both of these were uh, associated with higher risk of diabetes. Okay, so that, that's all very intuitive. Um, here we're seeing um, this BMI independent pathway. Um, so higher birth weight associated with lower risk of diabetes. Um, in other words, lower birth weight associated with higher risk of diabetes. Okay, and those sort of pancreatic changes are observed more on the um, the sort of the, the undernutrition um, side of, um, of prenatal development. Okay. So what uh, our takeaway from this um, is that if we want to mitigate um, these prenatal processes, so mitigate the, the birth weight associated diabetes risk, um, and we only focus on obesity and weight gain, we may be missing a really important process. Okay, so it might be, um, we, we might need things like 
focus on physical activity, maybe different types of physical activity that could mitigate um, things like um, pancreatic deficiencies. Okay. So this last piece, um, collaborative work. So this topic, of course, touches on so many different domains. Um, so I just wanted to provide a few examples of the collaborative work um, that I've done. Um, this, of course, one of the motivating um, features of um, the fetal programming um, for me is the potential um, sort of role of propagating and exacerbating um, inequities um, from generation to generation, um, thinking about um, policies from this DOHA perspective, um, how do we best communicate um, epigenetics and developmental origins work? Um, these last two um, are PhD dissertations, um, one examining tipped worker subminimum wage on infant size for gestational age, another examining ethnic enclaves and preterm birth on uh, Asian American subgroups. Okay, so. I want to leave a lot of time for questions. Um, so this just um, provides a sort of a longer term view of where I'd like to go. Um, so here's the kind of the four domains um, that I covered here in rows. Um, there's a lot of work that could be done with existing data, which is mainly what I have focused on. Um, there's also a lot of work that could be done with novel cohorts. Um, and as uh, I hope I have illustrated, um, you know, I, collaboration is the key to bring people together with different substantive areas, methodological expertise. Um, this top row is where most of my funded work lies here. Um, so this one, this actually is um, the first study that I showed on the preconception weight loss. Um, I would uh, really cherish um, moving forward um, with some of these other sort of child focused um, studies, um, thinking about, uh, you know, contextual and policy drivers of early, um, early childhood health, um, you know, different, different factors um, that could potentially mitigate these processes. I focused on physical activity, there could be many dietary factors as well. Um, understanding trajectories and sort of, um, sort of interventions on appetite of traits and eating behavior. Um, and then a final piece is, um, you know, give it within this sort of developmental framework um, and critical periods and thinking about what's happened um, with COVID and COVID lockdowns and what's happened, you know, it's sort of a shock a shock to the growth trajectories for children, um, thinking about impacts on, um, you know, screen time and diet. Um, what are the long-term implications of that? Um, particularly if, you know, if we are dealing with critical windows um, and it's sort of reset um, their, their growth and development. Um, you, you know, characterizing what that looks like and understanding how to, to handle it. Um, is um, it also an interest of mine that I, I have not begun to pursue, but would love to work with people doing so. Okay, um, just quickly acknowledgements. Um, I'm really thankful for uh, the Birch, um, this K, the K-12 award that allowed me to kind of pursue this perinatal health um, direction. Um, NICHD, NIDDK, PCORI, um, and a pilot grant, really amazing collaborators and mentors, incredible analysts, um, and wonderful students, um, PhD and MPH students. Okay, so I'll leave you with this. This is one of my favorite activities and places in Chapel Hill. <laughs> So that's all I have from here. Um, I guess we can open There's for a questions. lot of questions on the okay. yeah. Let's start Q and A. Mm -hmm. Let's see. 
Okay, so I, I'll start with, uh, I'll just start from the top. I'm seeing three. Yeah. Am I seeing them all? Yeah. yeah. Oh, okay, Kat, we'll do it. Oh. Thanks. Okay, uh, one from Rob Lustig. Charlotte Boney in Pediatrics 2005 demonstrated those with LGA had an OR for later obesity of 2.0, while those with GDM had an OR for obesity of 3.0, and the two together with an OR of 9.0. What are the synergies of the two distinct patterns of early effects? That's a great question. So, so the LGA Can I suggest exposure... doing some translation of acronyms for the <laughs> oh <laughs> for the non-obesity <laughs> research the time to process as well. So <laughs> um, those with LGA, it's a large for gestational age. So these were people who were born um, big babies, large, big babies. Big, exactly large babies um, had higher um, odds of later obesity, and then GDM gestational um, diabetes. So those who were gestated in a gestational diabetes environment um, also had higher um, risk of obesity. And then the two together looked like having LGA and GDM um, in early life had a um, super multiplicative um, estimated effect. Um, so what are the synergies of these two patterns? I mean, I think, I think there's a lot going on there. Um, you know, GDM, those with GDM could have, um, could have sort of more severe of, you know, LGA or gestational weight gain. Um, there's, you know, metabolic influences of GDM. Um, LGA is also, you know, big babies. There's also a genetic component as well. Um, just, in terms of larger body size that may not be correlated with health um, um, health effects. Um, so I think it's it's that is suggesting that there it's getting at the sort of those multiple processes. So there's you know metabolic effects, um, there could be you know changes in you know each of the body systems that I talked about and it could be you know together um, you end up with a very high risk. Okay, uh, one more question from Rob Lustig. What about environmental obesogens? Do these play a role in, in your analysis? Do you have any pregnant urine? That's a really great question. Um, so there is a, um, as you probably know, um, a really large body of research on um, sort of, you know, the chemical environment and um, prenatal exposures to it. Um, and those those kinds of types of effects really mirror um, what I was talking about here. I focused on maternal obesity um, and birth weight, um, but many, you know, based on both the mechanistic um, literature and epi, um, a lot of them are, appear to follow very similar processes. Um, so I haven't personally done work in that area, but um, uh, you know I see it as very parallel um, and would be interested in doing so. Um, I don't have um, access to pregnant urine, but um, I think that would be a really exciting direction. And one more um, from uh, Justin White. Great presentation on the relationship between high birth weight and high BMI later in life. You noted that the potential biological pathways, there could also be a social, a social pathway example, high birth weight children might be more likely to be given an, obs, sorry, uh, obesogenic, a, diet. obesogenic diet. Yeah. <laughs> At home or to have fewer healthy food options in the neighborhood. Thoughts on how to disintegrate biological and social factors? Disentangle, sorry. <laughs> um, that's another great question. I um, I I don't have a neat and tidy answer to to how to do that, except to say that um, absolutely those social pathways are critical. Um, they could be um, both. Um, sort of mediating the, the way that you described, um, that the way that child, children are fed and the sort of, sort of environments that they're exposed to um, could 
um, sort of result um, from these early life um, factors. They could also be more moderating um, where they're sort of, um, you know, un unhealthy um, food environment conditions could exacerbate any vulnerabilities that they have. Um, so in terms of disentangling, um, we should work on that. <laughs> we, and, you know, it's that's that's a very worthy um, approach. Um, I do think that these sort of um, pathway approaches, um, you know, trying to differentiate different mediating pathways, thinking about you know doing a very thoughtful examination of subgroups, um, is kind of the way forward. Um, there's also sort of systems um, systems approaches as well that might do a better job um, that I have work in progress on an um, agent-based model that does simulations over generations. Um, that is, it's, um, it's still in progress, but um, that kind of approach where you can manipulate um, you know, individual factors, um, given the evidence that we have, um, is another approach to do that. Um, just, just a question on your finding related to gender differences. Mm -hmm. I find that quite interesting and, and also a bit puzzling. Yeah. Um, I'm aware of this study where they uh, investigated the uh, effects on obesity of the Mexican soda tax, where they also found that uh, it led to weight uh, decreases in girls, but not in boys. So it appears to me that that sort of validates your finding, but also that it suggests that uh, these kind of policies are inherently more effective in women than in men, or is that uh, mistaken? Um, I think it depends, as most <laughs> as most things do. Um, you know, I, whether whether these are sex differences or gender differences is really unclear. It's probably a little of both. Um, and I think, especially when it comes to um, food environment and feeding, there's documented gender gender differences, um, but there's also sex differences in terms of development um, and also the, the fetal programming piece um, as well. Um, so yeah, for that, I had forgotten about the soda tax um, gender difference. Yeah, so it's showing a greater response um, to it's sort of that environmental approach. I think it's a little more complicated with children and taxes because there's that layer of the family and the parents, um, I guess, depending on the age of the, the children. But that's a great question. <laughs> yeah. I do have a question, Jane, and, and it's it's great to uh, to hear your research and and uh, in the uh, looking at the associations, the physiological uh, uh, and also the uh, environmental uh, challenges that our population uh, is facing with uh, childhood obesity. I'm also a cardiometabolic researcher, kind of novice researcher, but I uh, looking at. Uh, the implications and uh, risk factors in our Latino population. I was involved, uh, uh, I was part of this initiative through Michelle Obama, one of the foundations on childhood obesity. Yeah. So we did some interventions at the school system. So it was just targeting, uh, looking at the social determinants of health in the environment of those kids. But of course, uh, it's all about collaborating with each other. But uh, congratulations on, on your research. Yeah, congratulations on working on that project. That's incredible. Yeah, it was so exciting to see, but it's all about collaborating. And we had some of the funding from the Coca-Cola Foundation. So of course, we were trying to get the soda machines out uh, from the school. We got the sunny water instead. So it was a challenge, but we did it for some time, but it's just that uh, we were able to do some intervention, exercise, uh, and, and integrate them with a health uh, with a health department. But it was just uh, so it's so hard because you start and then you let go. But it's all about talking to the families and 
interacting with the school teachers and it, it was tough but we did it and of course weight loss we were using the diabetes prevention program uh, as a model too okay that's great yeah that the industry response to the beverage regulations is very interesting as well where they're you know we sort of we can tax and ban sugar sweetened beverages so they came up with new products right mm -hmm. <laughs> just about at the top of the hour. I get to meet with her next, but yeah, I'll close this out. <laughs> well, thank you for presenting this research and, um, and the future directions for your own work and the collaborative work. There's a lot of really interesting things here. And I think you'll find out over today as you get to meet people, a lot of um, shared interests such as Edna's work and Luke's work and, and many other people here. So Great. Looking forward to having you visit for the rest of the day. Great. Thank you so much.